morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome to Directions 2016. And as Kirk said, we're gonna have an incredible day, just full of information, research, analysis, a lot of discussion, and I'm sure, knowing a few of you here, a little bit of debate. But uh, one thing we will certainly be doing is we'll be looking at how this marketplace we are all competing in and living in is continuing to change and evolve. And what I want to do in the next few minutes is really just kick off the day by talking about what we see are the important broad steps we need to take, broad strategies in order to grow in this evolving market and to lead most importantly, to lead in this market. And as we look at the growth opportunities in the market in 2016 and beyond, we're gonna use this map. I think it's one you've probably seen once or twice when you've come to IDC. I hope most of you have, it's the third platform. And I think most of you realize that that's our way of describing the new set of technologies that are really driving and enabling the growth in our marketplace. And if you want to grow, if you want to lead in IT for the next 20 years, this is the territory you need to live in. And of course, the technologies, I'm sure I probably don't have to go through them, but in case people don't know uh, cloud, mobile, social, and big data at the center. And of course, in the last couple of years, we talked about this next wave of technologies on the third platform, the innovation accelerators, which of course include virtual reality, 3D printing, uh, you know, next generation security, internet of things, cognitive, and, and more. More will be coming over the next several years. So this is where the technology base for growth is now and over the next several years. We'll, sh we'll share in a minute just where in 2016 uh, we are in terms of third platform taking over our market. But of course, the other important part of this map sits on top of the technologies. And those are really the use cases, the emerging high growth, high value, digital transformation use cases that are emerging in every industry uh, in, on the planet and that are enabled by these third platform technologies. But of course, as I'm sure all of us have already seen, these uh, digital transformations aren't just enabled by third platform technologies, they are in turn coming around and stimulating more and more growth of those technologies. So there's a virtuous circle here. If you want to compete and grow, you need to become expert at third platform technologies and of course you need to use them and help customers use them in the use cases that matter which is about digital transformation. So I'm going to talk about just a few of these things here because I'm, I'm really just the, the opener for the day just trying to set the table a little bit. Uh, we've got a whole day full of IDC analysts traveling all over this map to help guide you, whichever part you compete in, to help guide you with information on what's happening in the market now and where is the mark go market going over the next several years. So I don't want to steal their thunder. What am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about something that impacts all of this. And it's one word, scale. Now, some of you who were at Directions 2012 may remember we were talking about scale, that this was going to be a big issue as we migrated from the second platform to the third platform. Um, you may remember, how many of you here were at Directions 2012? Right, remember these dogs? Yes. Well, uh, I, th I used that just to uh, talk about just one example, which was in, you might say, the category of client software, where we were seeing the old days, second platform PC software, the new days, mobile apps. And you could already see, you know, three, four years ago uh, that we were seeing the volumes on mobile apps going way off the charts, two orders of magnitude or more in volume, and price points dropping through the floor by at least two orders of magnitude as well. So for folks who competed in this part of the market or were somehow attached to it, the third platform scale was already starting to wreak havoc. And of course, uh, when you go to a new platform, new scale wreaking havoc is not a new phenomenon. If you go back to the dinosaur days of the shift from the first platform to the second platform back in the early 1980s, you know, if you go way back, those of you who've been at Directions a few years, you'll remember I've mentioned these, our old friends at 
at uh, Wang and Deck, and you know these were leaders coming from the first platform into the second platform. On the software side, we had Cullinet and MSA. How many of you remember MSA? I mean, that's not many, right? And uh, I saw a few hands. There you go. And but they were leaders. And I've talked before that you know they basically disappeared because they certainly struggled with the new technologies that were coming up. Of course, the new set of technologies on the second platform challenged them, but really what killed them, what killed them was as we went to this PC and client server world, some of you will remember, the, the, the scales were just so different. Think about the number of PCs you'd sell compared to the number of mainframes. The volumes of sales went way up. The number of customers you had to sell to went way up. Price points of software and the hardware went way down. The distribution channel structure you had to put in place to reach all of those customers exploded. Uh, and, and the pace, the pace of change uh, accelerated. So really, you know, I was trying to think about since we're at this threshold of going to a new scale on the third platform, what did these guys feel like? as the new marketplace was emerging and this new scale came in. And of course, the thing that popped into my head immediately was an old show, I Love Lucy. You, many of you remember I Love Lucy, right? Yeah, yeah we got a few. And, and actually, some of the younger folks have probably seen it on TV land, right? But uh, some of us remember watching it. I think it was on CBS you know, when there were four networks. Um, but they were basically like the three broke girl, uh, sorry, two broke girls of their day. Right, so I've lost the older folks now. They don't know what two, two broke girls is. But, um, but anyway, you, some of you may remember that there was an episode where Lucy and her friend Ethel were in, inexplicably, they had a job in a, in a chocolate factory. And they're on an assembly line. Yes, I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads. And, and they had a very simple job. You know, the chocolates would come down the conveyor belt and they had to take each one off, wrap it in white paper and put it back on and somebody else would put them in boxes. So all was going well until somebody in the back room decided to change the volume Right, the scale of chocolates coming down and the speed, right? So <laughs> this is what happened. Fine, you're doing splendidly. Speed it up a little. Now to me, I, I, I don't know about you, I had totally forgotten about the best part of this, which is the end. You're doing a great job. Speed it up a little, right? I mean, do any of us feel like this is what Wang and Deck and the rest must have felt like? They're, they're working as hard as they can to cope with the second platform. They're moving as fast as they can. And then someone says, hey, that's great. Now speed it up a little, all right? And of course, they just fell off the cliff. All right, does anyone here feel like this? I think we should, because take a look at the people, the companies that are born on the third platform, and you know, think about the SaaS or the infrastructure as a service guys or mobile apps, the number of offerings they come out with, the pace of new offerings is just unbelievable compared to what we've seen before, the, pay, the, the rate at which they, they come out with those. So it's, it's, you know, I'm sure we all look around saying, how do they do that? How do they do that? You know, some of us might do 50, or 20 releases a year, and they're doing 1,000 releases a year. So if, if you don't feel like that, hold on, because I've got news for all of us in this room. Over the next several years, we're gonna start to feel an awful lot like Lucy in the Chocolate Factory, right? We're gonna see that play out on steroids, you might say, because over the next several years, we're gonna see amazing Pieces, remember that map, the third platform and digital transformation map I showed you? Key elements of that are going to see a scale jump like you wouldn't believe. So, yes, some things are going to double and some will even quadruple over the next several years. And we used to think that was actually a lot. But what I'm going to share with you in the next few minutes is we're going to see key parts of this marketplace grow by a lot more than that. We're going to see growth of sevenfold, tenfold. 50-fold, 100-fold, 1,000-fold, and yes, unbelievably, 10,000-fold 
scale jumps just over the next three or four years. Okay, so I hope I've got you in suspense. Some of you are looking at that 10,000, I'm sure, quaking in your boots. I know I, it's, it's hard to imagine, but by the time we get to it, you'll understand that is, that may actually be an underestimate of some of the scale we'll see. So, um, to me, this, these type of scale jumps we'll see over the next few years raises two existential questions for all of us. Number one, are we equipped right now to compete in a marketplace that has this dramatic a change in scale? Again, think of our friends Wang, Deck, Cullinet. They weren't equipped. Are we equipped as we go to these even bigger numbers? And the second question, of course, is if the answer is no, what do we need to do to get ourselves ready? Again, not just to compete, but to lead in this digital transformation, third platform marketplace at scale. Okay, so to answer that question, I'm going to go through three neighborhoods, you might say, in the third platform and DX world, just to show you some examples of the scale uh, in particularly important areas. And so it's going to, we're going to start with the big picture, really just looking at broad adoption of this whole third platform and DX world itself. How quickly will that scale, will that jump over the next several years? And then I want to dive down uh, more deeply into two different areas. So on one side, we're going to look at the technologies and look at two technologies that themselves are going to scale rather dramatically over the next several years and that in turn are going to stimulate a lot of this broader scaling in the market. And then we're going to take a look at more of the human side, at uh, communities of people and the way they interconnect uh, and how that's going to scale over the next several years. So stay with me. We'll take a little tour through this. And I think you'll at the end of this, I don't think you'll be surprised at all by the 100,000, 10,000, or even greater scaling. So let's jump, let's start right at the very top and look at the third platform itself. Now, over the past several years, I've shown a chart that shows second platform spending and then third platform spending. And I think we all know the trend. Second platform has been going down, third platform has been going up. So this is the latest version that our team put together. You can see the blue is, is second platform spending and the orange is uh, third platform spending. And so a couple of things I want to point out here. First is, if you look at 2016, where we are right now, that's the second set of columns. This is the first year in which third platform spending will actually exceed second platform spending. Now, some of you may say, well, Frank, about four years ago you showed this, and I think it was out in 2020 you said it would, it would cross over. And here I am before you. Yes, that is exactly what we thought four years ago. And so really this is part of the message is, folks, it's accelerating. For it speeded up a little, it is speeding up right at us. So, and one part, by the way, of that, and we'll hear a little bit later today, is one big part are those innovation accelerators I talked about that weren't there four years ago. Now, IoT in particular is, going to, is adding quite a bit to those orange bars. The second thing is, again, really about how quickly will these things diverge. If you look at the growth rates from 2015 through 2020, you can see Again, recession land in second platform and a boom land in third platform. And believe me, I don't think any of us, not only in our professional but our personal lives, look at the economic uncertainty in the global marketplace today. There are not a lot of markets where you can say we're going to see 13% growth. Right, so that is, it's obvious how important the third platform is. And here's another scale number for you. If you look at that gap between second platform, now third platform's bigger, and how much bigger it will be as you go out to 2020, that gap between 2016 and 2020 is going to grow sevenfold. So this thing is accelerating. All right, so what's the message here for us? This is the simplest message I'll give you all day, and, it, and again, it's a repeat. Uh, we need to center ourselves on third platform technologies. I would argue by the time we get to 2018, all of us, whether we're in hardware or we're in software or we're in services, as close to 100% of our leading edge offerings have to be 
either cloud services or somehow enabling and supporting cloud services and optimize for them. And of course, all of the other related parts of the third platform world. It's going to be very hard for us to convince our customers we can help them with their third platform journey if we're lagging in our own third platform journey. So I guess the key message on third platform is, yes, speed it up a little. Speed it up a little. Now let's jump over to the upper part of that map, and that is the digital transformation, which is enabled by third platform technologies. And of course, we're going to have Bob Parker drilling down into this a little bit later this morning. Uh, but I just want to give you kind of a top level view. Digital transformation, well, first, what is that? I think it can, can be thought of simply as using third platform technologies to create value, to create competitive advantage uh, by using uh, the third platform technologies to either create new offerings or to uh, leverage new business models or perhaps to create new relationships. And uh, if you think about where are customers in this, well, you have to think about almost every single industry. I, I think about, as examples, financial services. No, sorry, not financial services, manufacturing. Where manufacturers, I think we're all seeing this, are using third platform technologies to add new services around their products and to, in fact, make their products smarter and connected products. Or you think about uh, financial services. No, sorry, I keep wanting to bring up financial services. It's not coming. Okay. All right, health. Health is a huge, <laughs> health is a huge area of digital transformation. Um, you'll see in a minute, it's, it's one of the top three uh, use cases for digital transformation. And of course, health providers are using things like analytics, uh, using uh, cognitive, using IoT to develop uh, faster and cheaper and more accurate diagnostic tools and to be able to develop faster and cheaper uh, accurate and effective uh, treatments for diseases. And you'll never guess what the next industry is. Anyone guess? Yes, okay. Here's a <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Gaming. Uh, oh. Well, it is kind of gaming. Sorry. For those of you who are in financial services, I'm sorry, but <laughs> it's a form of gaming. But uh, financial services using these technologies to reduce fraud, waste, and abuse, for example, uh, by uh, 50%. That's what our financial services team are projecting. So, yeah, we're seeing lots of examples of this. Now, what about scale? Okay, that's, if that's the name of the game over the next several years, where are our customers going with their digital transformation initiatives. And what I want to sh uh, show you here is something we call a maturity scape. And so it's really, it's, it's a simple five stage maturity model. I think we've all seen those before. And if, as usual, on the left side are the folks who are, we call them digital resistors, uh, you could call them digital deniers, <laughs> losers. <laughs> no, that's, that's a bit harsh, but um, <laughs> look, what happens at the Heinz Center stays at the Heinz Center, okay? Um, but the folks who really are just not doing anything with, with third platform technologies to change their company or their industry. And then at the right side are the rocket scientists who are, you, they are out at the front edge in their industries using the latest third platform technologies to create new offerings, change biz mo business models, and really change their world they compete in. And of course, everybody is distributed among these. We've done uh, research work to basically try to get a sense in 2015, well, where are enterprises broadly on their journey to digital transformation? And you can see that the bulk of enterprises today are in those first, uh, uh, sort of second, third bar, which are really the early stages of digital transformation. And about 64% are just really starting their digital transformation journey. You can see on the far right, the last two bars, the more advanced, there is about 22% of the market today, 22%. So there's a lot of activity, but still early days. So you may be asking, Frank, how is this going to scale? How is digital transformation going to scale? Well, we predict that by the time we get out to 2020, the percentage of your customers who are going to be in those two advanced bars in that 22% of the most advanced participants, that that's going to double. 
that by the time we get to 2020, we'll be looking at 45 to maybe even 50% of enterprises are going to be at least at stage four in their journey. So why is this important? Well, I think one obvious reason it's important to all of us is this means that digital transformation initiatives are going to be driving a larger and larger percentage of all the IT spending that goes on in the marketplace. Right? If you think about uh, all of the software, all of the hardware, all of the cloud services, everything, a larger and larger portion of that is going to somehow originate with some executive saying, you know, we need to modernize our retail operation or we need to, you know, we're in, man we're in manufacturing transportation, we need to somehow get into this transportation as a service business. Or, you know, you name it, you know, next generation drug discovery and on and on and on. So we need to be connected to those. We need to know what the primary use cases are so we can connect our offerings to where the demand is being driven. Of course, a second impact is related to this, is a larger and larger percentage of IT budget is actually going to be controlled by line of business executives. We've seen this obviously coming the last several years. This is going to accelerate as more and more of IT, and this is really the third impact, more and more of the IT and services that we offer are going to be buried within the offerings of these type of companies. You know, the financial services companies, the health companies, the manufacturers. Digital transformation is about them using IT to generate the next generation of their offerings. So a lot of our IT is actually going to reach the end customer without our name on it. It's going to be buried underneath the covers of our customers, our enterprise customers' offerings. So those are big changes for all of us. And so to me, I think it's pretty obvious with this scale up of digital transformation adoption, as well as third platform adoption, we need to get ready in 2016. I mean, if we're not actually ready, we're, we're falling behind. We need to get ready for an IT marketplace that is increasingly third platform centered, and so we need to be, and connected to digital transformation use cases that are really generating that demand, driving that demand. So we need to change our offerings so we're optimized for those DX use cases. And of course, we need to totally rethink our go-to-market in order to make sure that we are connecting with the right customers, the right routes to market. Because if our technology is going to go through this industry or that industry, we better know which industry and we better know which companies in those industries are our best routes to market. Okay, so lots to do. I guess I'd say again with both of these, core message, speed up a little. So now look, let's go down. We're going to, again, we'll go under the covers all during the day on all this, but I want to go down, look just now at two technologies that are going to be really catalytic in driving a lot of this increased scale of third platform and digital transformation adoption. And so the first one I want to talk about uh, if, if, first, I want to ask you, did you go to CES? How many of you went to CES this year? Anybody go? Okay. Okay, so CES, incredible. I mean, uh, there were 20,000 new products introduced at CES this year. I mean, that's, that is mind-blowing. Talk about scale. And right at center stage, Probably the largest percentage of those offerings were things, as in Internet of Things. And, you know, I can't possibly tell you all of the things that were announced there, but let me give you a few examples. Probably the gaudiest smart thing, Internet of Thing thing uh, that I saw there was this, which is the 4GT, which uh, beautiful yellow, just spectacular, Car. I'm not a car guy, but I even was drooling over this car. From our perspective, what's interesting is it's got uh, 50 sensors, 24 processors, and it generates 100 gigabytes of data an hour. And by the way, if I've, I've got your attention. If you are a car person, it can be had for only $400,000, okay? Special, I think 399,000 maybe the next week, but it's coming out later this year. 
So go check out Ford. Now, the one I liked, this was not my favorite. My favorite was the other end of the spectrum, price spectrum. It was $100. It was Withings Smart Thermometer. And this device has 16 independent infrared sensors in it that are able to do 4,000 readings within a matter of seconds to generate an incredibly accurate thermometer just by putting it on a child's or, or anyone's uh, forehead. And you can imagine, think about the, and you'll hear more from Vernon a little bit later this morning about IoT, but you know, the cost of sensors is dropping so dramatically. You know, a few years ago, this might have had two or three or four sensors in it, and I can pred predict the next generation in a couple of years will probably have 30 or 40 sensors in them. And of course, the more sensors you have, the more your sampling error reduces. So these things are just going to get cheaper and cheaper and more and more accurate. And of course, there were lots of other examples. You know, there were, you know, patches you put on your skin. This one was from L'Oreal to to see whether the, uh, you've been out in the sun too long and you know, the lady with the optical sensing up there, you know, that's being introduced for a lot of reasons. One is security, obviously, you know, uh, retina, retina scanning, but also there are folks in marketing who are using this to determine well, what's the mood, what's the emotion of the person who's using this product or service. Um, and all the way down to the farming, that orange gizmo is just you put it next to your crops and it's monitoring the soil and giving you feedback. So lots and lots of these things. If you think about it though, all of these things together are forming what is basically a massive and expanding perimeter edge, smart edge a, uh, a, of continuous sensing for both enterprises and for consumers. So this continuous sensing, continuously sensing edge in the marketplace. Now, how is this going to scale over the next several years? Well, the number of devices between now and 2020 is going to triple. So it'll be about 30 billion of these devices by the time we get out to 2020. And Vern and I, I think, both agree on this, that this is going to be one of those numbers that in a couple of years we'll realize, well, we probably should be more like 50 or 60 billion, whatever the number is, but it's probably too low. But it's, it's already tripling over the next several years. But let me show you a more important scaling, and that's this one. 10x growth in the number of new services and apps that are being developed around the existence of these devices. And I, I don't mean, you know, smartwatch apps or smartphone apps. We've taken those out. We're talking strictly about new apps that are designed with this idea of, hey, we've got a smart new thing out on the edge. Can we somehow connect to it, send data to it, collect data from it, and create some valuable service that's based on that? Right, so this is going to be a very important part of the IoT market is the developer community that is building around it. So just hold that thought for a second because I want to go to the second technology area and that was, you could say, maybe the backstage player behind the curtain at CES. When you looked at all these smart things, what was the common connection for many of them? It was cognitive or AI more broadly. And of course, uh, if you think about those terms, there are lots of other terms that are emerging out there, deep learning, intelligent fabric, and so forth. But there were, a, if you think about a lot of the devices that were out on the CES show floor, what they had behind them was they were connecting to a, uh, an AI back end that was sensing what those devices were experiencing, finding patterns and algorithms and generating uh, recommendations or behaviors back out to improve the performance of those devices. And so uh, one example that we saw there was IBM uh, had an announcement uh, with Medtronic where they had put together, uh, uh, they had connected Medtronic's uh, insulin pumps and glucose monitors to IBM's Watson in order to be able to detect hypoglycemic events. They'd be, they were able to anticipate with a high degree of accuracy when a very low blood sugar event was likely to happen for someone who had diabetes three hours in advance, which is early enough to actually be able to do something about it. So very, very exciting potential in the health area. Um, now in the automotive area, that was kind of the real pizzazz area at CES. There was a lot about autonomous cars and Toyota, which by the way announced a billion dollar investment plan in deep learning to power 
all of their autonomous cars, they had this little demo. These were like little cars and uh, they were connected to, again, a, a deep learning backend and within four hours were able to sort of sort out what this environment was and be able to avoid collisions and so forth. So that was, you know, a big deal in the self-driving car world. These things are not going to work unless they have AI backends. Uh, uh, of course, it wasn't just CES. Any of us who were just living in the world the past few, day, uh, past few years, and we use a smartphone or in our car, we talk to it, and it actually can have a high degree of accuracy in understanding, well, what are we saying? Um, Google announced last year that they had, uh, through the use of their deep learning technology, uh, reduced the error rate in you know, uh, the ability to recognize what we were saying, voice recognition. Um, it had been 28% uh, error rate back in 2013, which isn't that long ago, and last year they had reduced it to 8%. And I'm sure it's lower this year, it's probably more like 5%. So we're talking about a five-fold improvement or decrease in the error rate in the understanding of human speech. Um, and then, of course, another area we know for years about AIs have been people have been trying to train AIs to play chess and to be chess masters. That was kind of uh, early days of, uh, of IBM pre-Watson was, was doing that, Gary Kasparov and that whole thing. Um, but now a research team fed their AI uh, data about 175 million chess positions. So imagine that. Any chess players out here? 175 million chess positions, and they let the AI basically play itself for 72 hours. And at the end of the 72 hours, it had reached what's called international master level in chess, which basically means that that AI was in the top 2.2% of chess players in the world after three days. Right? And more recently, you might have seen that... Uh, that uh, Google announced that they, their deep learning system had, uh, they're, they're challenging uh, humans in playing the game Go, which is infinitely more complex than chess, and actually beat one of the top ranked players uh, in Go. So um, you can see there's kind of a common pattern here. Lots of data, some of it's pulled in from IoT devices, the machines are able to digest that, analyze it, come up with strategies. You might say come up with algorithms and next, next wave of software and solution, and it just gets better at a very accelerated rate. Some of you may be asking, well, Frank, these are great examples, but what is the next frontier for applying AI to kind of human endeavor? Well, some of you may have noticed a couple of months ago out in Arizona at a golf tournament, there was a, uh, a robot that uh, on its fifth try actually did what it took Tiger Woods a long time to do, which is it hit a hole in one in five tries. I know the golfers out here are getting very nervous, right? Okay, no, they're not gonna replace us. <laughs> but, and actually I'm cheating. In full disclosure, this is probably the least connected of all the devices I showed you, but I'm sure that somebody's working on, you know, how do we get this thing so it's got an even higher degree of accuracy. And I think, you know, the question here is this morning, okay, well, it's great, this is cool stuff, but is it scaling? Is it scaling up? And the answer, of course, is yes. It's scaling big time. Uh, what that 50x means is that we, uh, if you think last year at all the developer teams that were out there, what percentage of those developer teams were actually building deep learning, cognitive AI services and capabilities into their apps and services? Probably 1% or less. 1% or less. This was still was considered new frontier, but we're seeing such a democratization of access to these services and that we are predicting that by the time we get out to 2018, so three years from now, 50% or more of developer teams will be using AI, cognitive, deep learning services within their solutions. Not within all of their solutions. That, that would be rather dramatic, but at least we're talking about an expertise we'll be building in a very dramatic way in the developer community around AI over the next three years. So if you put the IoT story together and cognitive story together, we're really talking about what happens when you connect a continuously sensing and expanding perimeter of things with this collectively learning back end of AI. Really th thinking about it, it's connected learning, it's 
it's collective learning and it's accelerated learning with these systems. You, we believe you're talking about a new foundation for the next generation of solutions and services, the next generation of killer apps. I think it's gonna be very clear if you know, in a few years you are in the solutions business and you are not somehow taking advantage of both that expanding edge, sensing edge, and this collective learning back end, your application, your service is gonna look very, very quaint. It's, it's, it's not gonna be keeping up with the front edge of where the marketplace is. So some of you may be asking, well, what type of solutions are we talking about? And so I looked through uh, about 400 or so startups that are already building things using these technologies and just did a little bit of an analysis of well, what, type of, what, what type of workloads or apps or solutions are they? And of course, it won't surprise anybody, the biggest category was marketing. The marketing, the precision marketing, precision sales world are using you know, not only IoT d data from our watches, from our cars, from you know, uh, our, uh, our household, smart homes, everything. And of course, they're, they're on the front edge of using deep learning, machine learning, and uh, cognitive services to try to improve their understanding of pers prospective customers, their needs, and then be able to serve them and, and connect with them. But of course, right behind, you start seeing health. Remember, I, I, uh, I uh, mentioned that that was not, not only, a, I said it was a top three. In this, it's a top, top two. And you can see right behind it, financial services. So lots of industry focus. So that, that uh, digital transformation, that DX flavor is coming through very strong on this new foundation for next generation of apps. And you can see security uh, there. You know, people ask, well, this very broad, diverse, highly distributed IoT, how are we going to protect all that stuff way out there? And I think the answer is, is very clear. You know, we are going to use things like biometrics and the rest out on the, on the edge devices, but we're also going to be taking all that data that's coming through and we're going to be analyzing it in real time, looking for anomalous behaviors and try to mitigate it as quickly as possible in real time. You know, so what is our message here? I think it's pretty clear that in 2016, if we are not latching on to both ends of this new foundation, the expanding IoT edge, as well as uh, the cognitive or AI back end, the collective learning end, we're gonna really be missing and we're gonna be irrelevant when it comes to the next generation of killer solutions for our clients. Well, we just talked about AI. I just wanna assure everybody as we go to the last area, human beings still are important. You'll be glad to know. And so this is what I want to talk about in this last section, is really about the human factors, people, and how they connect. And the people I want to talk about specifically are developers. You know, I've said before that the market follows the solutions. Does anyone ever remember that? The market follows the apps, the market, market follows the solutions. That is the most dependable principle if you're trying to understand a market. And of course, a corollary to that is the market follows the developers, right? So if you can connect with the developers, understand what they're doing, you're gonna have a head start in being close to where the growth is in the marketplace. Now, um, last year, I spent quite a bit of time talking about how important startup developers were because there are thousands and thousands of them already at work on the third platform technologies developing some of these next generation uh, digital transformation or DX type of solutions. Um, so of course, I was curious. I looked, you know, in the last month or two, well, what's, are there any new ones? What's happening out there? And will it surprise anybody in this room, right? I found <laughs> there are a lot more, more and more and more, right? So these guys are like the wellspring of innovation and growth that's, that really is driving a lot of this digital transformation, uh, stimulated growth. And uh, I, I'll just repeat what I said last year, that you know, many of us may not be used on our radar, radar screen at looking at these little, little guys, but it's gonna be more and more important, critically important, as we're competing in the third platform and digital transformation world, we have to see these guys and we have to have a relationship with them. And of course, a lot of them have been snapped up. So some of you are paying very close attention to this community and you are connecting to them. 
But actually, today, I don't want to talk much about the startups. I want to look at the other end in that DX, that digital transformation developer community. There are some other companies, would you believe, beyond startups that are actually very interested in digital transformation. And uh, some of you may, you may recognize. So CVS Health. Uh, I, I was looking around, you know, are any big companies in, embarked on this? So uh, CVS Health actually has launched its digital innovation lab. Um, and it did that last year. And in fact, it, coincidentally, it's about a few blocks from here, right over on Huntington Avenue. I hope I'm pointing in the right direction. Uh, and they're all about having a, a, an innovation team, digital innovation team, trying to think about how can we use these technologies to improve not just our retailing, but really the health relationship that we have with our customers and, of course, all of the doctors and the rest of the medical ecosystem out there. Um, they're not alone. Uh, Capital One has launched three digital innovation centers, one in New York, one in Washington, D.C., and one, of course, in, in San Francisco. Home Depot, if you thought, uh, you know, like people who sold hammers and nails and stuff, digital transformation isn't important to them, they've launched their digital transformation center down at, uh, in Georgia, in the University of Georgia. And uh, Caterpillar, again, selling tractors, they've launched what they call their, their data innovation center. Um, so data, that's interesting, an interesting name for it because, of course, data is really the, again, kind of the core fuel for a lot of this digital transformation that's going on. They've launched their uh, data in, uh, transformation or innovation center out at University of Illinois Urbana. All right, so those are just four examples. Are they the only ones? No, they've got a lot of company. If you look in the last 18 months at the largest companies in the world, all of these companies and more have launched either digital innovation centers or groups within their company, or if you're like Bank of America, their CIO has been very adamant, well, you don't create a separate one, you embed it inside. That's a, that's a topic for another day, and our, our speaker at the end of the day, I'll be very interested to hear his perceptions on you know, how they handle digital transformation as well. But um, I did a, a, uh, an informal census, you might say, of the Fortune 100 to see, well, how many of the Fortune 100 have created digital transformation groups or teams? What percentage? Any, anyone want to venture a guess? What's it? 90? Well, that's, that's pretty good. Anyone else? How, how many? 22. 22. All right. So I think we bracketed the extremes. It was actually 59. Now, I can assure you, I know I missed some, right? I have to have missed some. But let's say it's somewhere between 60 and 70% of the Fortune 100 already, already are doing this, right? So. Um, to me, it's very clear. It's not just the startups anymore. It is all our largest and you know, biggest customers. And you know, how is this thing going to scale? Over the next three years, we're predicting that these type of companies that are launching digital transformation groups and initiatives, they are going to double the number of developers that are in those teams. They're going to double the number of their developer teams or more. And not only that, in these type of companies, two-thirds of their developers are going to be focused on digital transformation and digital innovation. Now, that's in contrast to the one-third in most companies that are focused on developing new things and innovation. So you add those two things together. These companies are doubling the number of developers, and they're doubling their focus on innovation within those teams, you're looking at a four-fold increase in really digital innovation capacity in these large companies. You know, so what is the message to us? I think it's pretty clear uh, whether it is the startups or whether it is the largest companies on the planet or anybody in between. We have to put a high priority on identifying who these developers are and becoming very relevant to them. Getting close to those developers is going to be a key part of getting close to that growth and leadership position. Now, developers growing, putting more attention on innovation, that's exciting, absolutely very exciting. But it's not that exciting if they're sitting there all by themselves, each developer sitting by themselves. It's much more interesting if 
they're connected, right? And so that's where, that's the next piece of this human connection picture comes into place. If you think about the millions of developers, the thousands of enterprises, all embarked on digital transformation, all those developers spewing out massive amounts of code and innovation. This is the future of how their companies compete. How is that stuff going to get to market? And so any of you who've been to IDC Directions the past few years, you've heard me talk about industry cloud platforms you know, early on. And we're talking about companies, whether it's GE or Johnson Controls or United Healthcare, or um, actually just two weeks ago, I got a note from my friends at Capital One. Remember I said they, they did open their digital, uh, they have three digital uh, uh, innovation centers. Just two or three weeks ago, they announced their own industry cloud platform. So they're basically opening up uh, to a community of developers in the financial services world to encourage. These guys are basically trying to aggregate industry data. They're trying to invite in lots of developers, including in the startups, by the way, to create, basically to take a leadership position in reinventing these industries, right? So these cloud platforms are really going to be the crossroads for where the API economy, you might say, really is transacted. And so talking about scale once again, what happens when you put all of these type of companies together, connect all of their developers together in industry-focused platforms? Number one, you're, we're starting to see a four-fold increase in the number of these industry cloud platforms. We're predicting over the next three years. So there are probably a little over 100 of these industry cloud platforms today. By the time we get three years out, it's going to be 500, four to 500 of them out there. And more importantly, you put all of those together, the developers, the companies, and you see a massive scale up in digital supply chain scale and digital distribution scale. So again, think about it. More and more of companies' IP value in the market is now in digital form in code and they are, going, they are going to these industry cloud platforms, and this is going to be a way for them to uh, source a hundred, a thousand times as many different providers of IP to be part of their offering, and they're going to be able to use these platforms to go out and distribute their offerings to a hundred to a thousand times or more as many customers, direct and indirect, as they have in the past. So, Remember, we've kind of gone with the smaller scale-up numbers up until now. Now it's getting big. We put all of these things together, the third platform technologies, the developers, the digital innovation centers, the industry cloud platforms, and boom! We're talking about a new scale of competing, not only in our customers' industries, but also in our own. So what do we need to do here? I think it's very clear. We need to make sure that we're positioned to, number one, identify which of our customers are, are becoming or have already become industry cloud platforms. They're going to be pretty important partners. And number two, we have to help all of our customers find and connect to and participate in these platforms that are going to be vital, a launch pad for them to scale up their own supply chains and their distribution networks. And as I said, uh, for launching our own. Now, the last thing I want to talk about that involves people. You know, we talked about developers. We talked really about this developer crossroads and communities. Last thing is maybe the most important one, and of course it's the biggest scale one. It's about customers. It's about the number of customers we touch and about how we engage with them. And if you think about this child here, there are thousands and thousands of companies Many of the logos we saw, including the startup companies, as well as all the big branded guys that are working feverishly right now to use all of these technologies and business approaches to create personalized, highly relevant, and persistent, always there, connections, engagements with her and with her entire network. And really, this, we at IDC think about this as a new model for customer engagement that's emerging off of the third platform 
that we talk about as customer intimacy at scale, which sounds like an oxymoron, right? How can you be intimate and be doing it on a massive scale? Well, the answer is in those technologies and business approaches. Think about what we've talked about the last half hour. It's been about all these scale-up technologies that allow us to ultimately scale up the number of customers we reach and the number of times we engage with them. And in fact, we believe that putting all of these pieces together we've talked about this morning, that companies right now are embarked on this uh, customer intimacy at scale strategy so that they can scale up the number of customers they touch by 1,000 to 10,000 fold. And, and to scale up the engagements, the touch points they have with these. Now, some of you may be a little skeptical. Okay, that's a big number. Those are two big numbers. How is that possible? So, well, full disclosure, if you're a B2C company like an Apple or a Microsoft or an Amazon, you already reach hundreds of millions of customers, right? So, I mean, to scale up the number of customers to 1,000 or 10,000 fold, we'd have to find some new planets in order to actually make that happen, right? So that's not where, for them, B2C, it's all about scaling up the touch points, the connections, and I think it's pretty obvious. I think we all see it. They are full speed ahead on that. But what about B2B? And quite a few of you in this room are in the B2B world. You may be saying, are you kidding me, Frank? Scale up the number of customers by 1,000-fold? Never mind 10,000-fold? That's impossible. No, it's not. No, it's not. In fact, it's already happening. One way it's happening is through the use of these, the API economy of these networks. Remember we talked about you're going to be able to use, if, you're di if you are digitally innovating, you're going to be able to distribute more and more of your offerings directly and through large digital indirect networks through those uh, API, through these in industry platforms. So th that's one piece. Here's another piece you may not have thought of. Uh, and let me give you an example. There is a technology company, B2B, that we all know well. They get about 80% of their revenue from about their 2,000 top customers, right? They have indirect, that's, that's 20%. So 2,000 top customers, 80% of their revenue. They are currently working on getting ready for scale in the DX world, uh, to totally revamping, go to market, their digital foundation, and what is their goal? They're looking to be able to, well, they actually have already started bringing in 38 million information on 38 million people. Now, who are these people? These are the employees in their enterprise customers. They are the employees in their indirect channel customers. And of course, they're also partners. And of course, the vision is all of these people are going to play an increasing role in accelerating adoption and business with your companies. So think about that. Yesterday's model, I focus on 2,000 enterprises. Third platform, DX at scale, I focus on almost 40 million individuals. And again, this is happening. And by the way, for those of you who are doing the math, that's a 20,000, 20,000 fold <laughs> jump in scale just from that. Okay, so this is happening. Why is it happening? I'll give an example. I'll, I'll, I'll give you one simple reason. Any of us who've been paying attention the last five years or so knows that in this market, if someone can scale, they certainly will scale. And so if we're in markets and our customers are in markets in which other companies are using these technologies to make these kind of scale changes, and they are, we have to. It's not a choice. It's not a choice for our customers. We're going to be stunted in the number of customers we do business with. We're going to be stunted in revenue. And we are not going to be able to engage customers at a level they're expecting from us and or from our customers. So this is going to be the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, you might say. Well, let me wrap up by just pulling all of these, these things together. I said, you know, we lead off this day trying to think about how do we grow and lead in a market that is growing, but it certainly is it's going through transformation and disruption, just like all of our customers' uh, industries are going through disruption and transformation. So, but I think the key point is that it's not just the transformation, but that we are at the threshold of jumping to a massive new scale 
in this transformed marketplace. So what do we need to do to find the opportunity? Well, we, we already talked about it. We know we have to become centered, totally focused on the third platform, and we have to, and this is very important, we have to connect our third platform offerings to the growing number and variety of digital transformation use cases to make them relevant. If we cannot see both of those together, we're not going to be a player in this market. So it's not just third platform. We have to become experts in what people are doing with these third platform technologies. We need to, as I said before, latch on to this, both ends of this new foundation for growth that's going to be at the center of the next generation of killer apps, both the, the continuously sensing edge as well as this collectively learning and accelerated learning core and make that part of our offerings and do that very quickly. And of course, we need to make sure that we are connecting to really the kingmakers in this industry who are the developers and that we are not only connecting to them, but we are also aware of and connecting to these platforms and communities where they come together and where they are going to, they're going to use as a launch pad for scaling their own supply chains and distribution networks and ultimately, as I said, the pot of gold to be able to scale up their ability to reach many, many more customers and engage with them on a much more intimate and, and personal level. So we're going to hear today there's a lot of money to be made if we do all of this. If we can achieve this, we're going to make a lot of money. But is it enough? Is this enough to compete and to lead in this DX market at scale? I would say the answer is no. Because if we uh, have the best cloud, if we have the best analytics, the best AI, the best IoT, the best augmented reality, but we have not changed our own companies to be able to compete at, and operate at a scale, at this DX scale, we're going to be like those guys. We're going to be like Wang. We're going to be like Cullinet. We, we need to not only offer these technologies to customers, to the marketplace, we need to use these technologies and approaches ourselves. We need to use third platform technologies in our own companies to drive our own digital transformation, creating new offerings, new business models for the new IT market. We need to be able to use AI and the Internet of Things so we have a better visibility of them on the market and we're able to operate our salespeople, our development people with better precision in the marketplace. We need to help our developers connect to the right industry cloud platforms and communities so that we can scale up our digital supply chains and our digital go-to-market and so that we can scale up our number of customers and scale up our engagements with them. Right? If, we, if we just focus on what we do for the customers but we don't turn it inside on ourselves and transform ourselves, we're going to feel an awful lot like Lucy in the Chocolate Factory, right? And so as you go through the day, I'd like you to have a mantra in your head, right? And here's how it goes. Scale, 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 scale. Whatever session you go to, think about what do I need to do and am I ready to operate at scale? Am I ready to lead, not just in this market, but lead in it at scale? Because we know over the next several years, as the market comes at us and says, you're doing a great job, but you need to speed it up a little, we want to be able to say, bring it on, baby. Bring it on. So thanks and have a great day. <laughs>